Good morning. My name is Patrick McCurdy. I am a retired police officer, and I grew up in a law enforcement and service-oriented family. And now I work for First Responder Wellness, um, helping first responders to get treatment and counseling and services for post-traumatic stress and uh, sometimes addiction and other accompanying symptoms that accompany that type of an injury. Um, today, we're on the Power of Our Story, which is a group of like-minded individuals, a tribe of people that are all themselves servants and helpers, uh, first responders, military, also rescuers, protectors, caregivers, and um, all in all, my friends <laughs> that I'm honored to call my friends and good people. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something that I'm very passionate about, and it's the brain and how it reacts to injury. Specifically, we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress injury, uh, and perhaps we'll touch a little bit if we have time on TBI, which is traumatic brain injury, and how those affect our first responders, but it may be very relative to you, even if you're not a first responder, and how it affects you, too. I'm going to share some pictures as we talk, and um, we'll talk about some things. And we're just, we could talk for days and barely touch upon this complex subject and the com complexity of the brain. So we're going to kind of give an overview about what happens. And I will use, because it seems to work well, some physical analogies and comparisons to illustrate the picture that we're talking about. Um, in my career, I saw my dad, who sp was a police officer in the early 60s and uh, worked for over 40 years in law enforcement. And I saw him um, later in his career slowly decline. And we didn't know at first what it was. We thought he was having difficulty at work, and he was. But we learned later it was because of um, his afflicted memory and his ability to remember things, especially in the short term. Uh, he was diagnosed with acute stress-induced Alzheimer's. Uh, the acute stress-induced portion, we didn't really learn about until later when I started doing this research. And um, he, in his late 50s, began to show symptoms. And then by the time he was, um, I believe, 70, uh, he passed away in 2013 from Alzheimer's. And that's a difficult journey for any family that's experienced that. We've been few through that, excuse me, a few times in my family with different family members as they get older. Um, most of them were older than my dad was. And um, it could be a combination of things because I think everybody has their knocks and bumps and jolts where they potentially injure themselves. And we in the first responder community are very bad about seeking help. In fact, where I work, we currently believe that when the average person has some sort of a breakdown or collapse, perhaps it's a memory loss or an injury or um, depression, suicidal ideation, we have learned that first responders tend to push 5, 10, or even 15 years beyond where a um, non-first responder will before seeking help. And to reiterate that to make sure it's clear, first responders are taught to just push on and to figure it out and not ask for help. And they do that throughout their whole life. And then eventually it comes back on them um, with um, difficulties, symptoms, and circumstances, and sometimes long-term illness. To compound those problems, uh, people, people seek their own medication to help with it, and they find what works for them. A lot of people find solace and comfort, solitude in things like meditation. Um, faith is a huge portion of it and accounts for a lot of healing. Um, when faith is lacking in a person's life, that seems to be a huge cavern, uh, a huge gaping hole that they try to fill with other things. Um, people find solace. We talk often here about journaling and um, connection. Uh, that's why we connect so often here with a tribe of like-minded people. But those are things that tend to get pushed away by people who are hurting, especially people like first responders who are taught to function autonomously by themselves. Um, you're taught as a police officer, you are by yourself. If you call for
And I appreciate this because it made me very a very independent thinker. And I think that also I was akin to that type of thinking and thought process anyway. And that's why I went into this. I'm a person who said, nope, I'm going to figure it out. I'm not going to ask for help. And I was taught that. And that was reinforced. They said, you should not call your sergeant or your, you should look for other resources. First, look in your general orders, your department manual, look at your partners. But if you call a sergeant, it means there's a problem you can't solve. And you don't want to be the person who has a problem you can't solve. Now, when I was um, in the bicycle unit, and I've talked about this a few times here, I had a crash, a pretty significant crash. We were traveling fast and I crashed. Um, and we tumbled, two or three of us were involved. And I got up and I knew something was wrong. And I didn't know what it was. My shoulder was killing me. But I got up, put all my gear back on, turned my handlebars because they were crooked and kept pedaling with a dislocated shoulder. Um, I pushed through that for 18 months, which you could imagine on a bicycle where you're continually turning and pivoting or driving a car. I couldn't turn the steering wheel on my car with my right hand, which is fine because I just used my left hand. Uh, but my right hand is also where I draw and fire my gun if I need to as a police officer. Um, and so I was taking chances, unnecessary chances with um, perhaps not only my safety, but the safety of those around me who I'm sworn to protect by doing that because I was the proverbial tough guy and I didn't need help and I didn't seek help because that's not the thing you do when you're a tough guy. I had a second crash after the 18 month period and it was very minor. It was the type of thing any bicyclist who's on a bike does on a regular basis where you just kind of tip over for no reason. And I knew that I had re injured or um, uh, perhaps injured worse my shoulder again and so I finally went in to seek help when I did the surgeon lectured me about waiting too long how bad the damage was how many torn ligaments and tendons and things I had and um, when he looked at my when I looked at my scans of my shoulder he said if you look at this here it looks like a cotton ball and these are all supposed to be smooth edges it's not supposed to be frayed and I had this mess entanglement inside my shoulder. Um, he also told me I wouldn't be able to do certain things after that, like push-ups or pull-ups. And just to prove him wrong, I do push-ups and pull-ups every single day of my life since then. <laughs> That's the type of mentality that first responders have. When you are in a fight in an alley with a homicide suspect, or when you are running into a burning building to carry out an injured child, or when you're sitting on a dispatch console on your literal 11th hour and things are falling apart and you continue to push through and um, despite the fact that you haven't eaten or taken care of yourself, that's that mentality is good and it helps us in those circumstances, but we tend to create those circumstances where they don't exist. We tend to create urgency where we don't need it and push through the truth as a patrolman, a patrol officer. I did that a lot where I would say, okay, I'll handle that call. I'll handle that call. And they were minor calls that didn't have to be handled. They weren't emergent people calling for help, but I would just push through to my own detriment. And I see my first responders nodding in agreement <laughs> because here we're fortunate to have um, doctors and dispatchers, firefighters, police officers accompanying me in this conversation. So with that physical analogy, uh, we see how I was a detriment to not only myself, but my job and the other people around me. And if needed, I'm sure I could have risen to the occasion and done what needed to be done. I did several times. Um, and during that time, I continued to compete physically in different sports and activities. However, um, I knew that there were certain movements and planes of movement that I couldn't do effectively. And again, um, if I sprung into action and did something, I would probably do permanent damage that couldn't be repaired. Now, if we use that analogy, when it comes to the brain, the same thing occurs. And because it is the brain and words like mental health and um, counseling and therapy are bad words for first responders because we're tough guys and we don't need that stuff. We often don't seek help where we need it the most. Our brain is the organ in our body that controls all bodily functions and is one of the most important functions for maintaining personal health. Um, but again, when we add that word mental health in front of it, we tend to shy away from that. 
The good thing about that is that this younger generation of police officers, firefighters, and dispatchers is much more in tune with that. And they tend to take care of their mental health more readily than other people do. Now, having said that, um, what I see, though, is when a person seeks help for mental health, they're still often criticized by my generation, the older ge generation, as being weak, um, which is interesting because if I, um, with my shoulder, complained about that, they wouldn't say I was weak. They'd say, go get that checked. And yet, if I said, I'm really not handling this call well, um, I've I've seen a couple of dead children in the last week, or you know, this really has impacted me and I'm having nightmares, I'd be considered weak in this profession. And that's something that we are working to overcome. I'm gonna share with you a couple of screens and um, show you a couple of pictures that I borrowed from the internet. So this first screen that I'm sharing, uh, can you give me a thumbs up if you see it? Good. This is a picture of the amygdala. That's the portion in green here. And the um, attachment to the amygdala in red is the hippocampus. The amygdala, some people call the lizard brain, and that's at the base of your brain and top of your spinal column. Uh, the amygdala is usually, for most normal people who are fully grown, the size of an almond. The reason it's called the lizard brain is because lizards and reptiles um, have this same structure, but don't have some of the other structures that we do. Dogs, other animals have this type of structure. And this is our reactionary structure that we use when we react to something, especially a threat. Um, the amygdala responds, and because it's at the top of the spine, that's where we see things like, for example, when you say, ooh, that gives me the chills, that would be a response initiated by the amygdala. And it could be a response to heat and cold or to fear, um, maybe to something that is emotionally based and our body responds to that. I think it's interesting, and this is a common diagram and they usually use these colors, uh, but I think it's interesting that in this scan, they look like red peppers because that part is easily inflamed and that's normal. Uh, it's just like when I have a critical response to stress. If I hear um, gunshots and screaming near me, my body composition will change. My brain will begin processing and pumping blood to my, my arms and my legs so that I can fight or flee, fight or flight. And then it will pump away from the center of my body, which is where my organs are. And so my digestion will temporarily shut down and other functions will shut down to enable me to be in the fight, so to speak. Another thing that happens in a time of stress is our perception changes. It is enhanced dramatically. Our vision will become more acute and open up or more commonly become tunnel focused, tunnel vision focused on a potential threat so that we can respond to that. Our hearing will change as well. Loud noises will be dampened in times of stress, meaning that if there are, if I'm shooting a gun, for example, if I'm shooting, if I'm yelling, I will not hear certain things unless they seem um, by my brain quickly and analyzing it pertinent to the threat at hand. Uh, many times people who experience a high level threat, perhaps a car accident, um, if they're a part of an assault, if they witness something like a riot or an assault on another person, then often they will explain or describe things like uh, change in perception uh, which is um, a slowing of time or an acceleration of time. And we see this sometimes in the movies where everything goes in slow motion as the car accident happens. You see the glass in the air. I've experienced that personally. And a lot of people who respond on a regular basis to threats have described the same type of phenomena called taxychia. I'm going to change this screen for just a moment here. And I'm going to show you another picture. Now, this is a brain scan. On the left, we see, and and uh, can I get a thumbs up if you see the blue and red brains too, please? Do you see that? Um, okay, I'm going to change the screen then just a moment here. Okay, now blue and red, right? Do we see that? Okay. On the left side is a healthy brain, and the healthy brain you can see has some areas that are red, and that shows that they're actively working. 
Um, when those areas are active, that's what we should see is warmth because of the blood flow and the increase in um, nutrients and blood and oxygen to the brain. It should be mentioned also, um, it is significant that the brain is made of fatty tissue. And some people who have brain injuries through diet, increasing, for example, to a keto diet or a fat-based diet, have been able to show significant improvement and changes in their brain by increasing the number of nutrients that the brain feeds off of. In our modern society, especially in America, we tend to feed off of carbohydrates and sugar, which is short-term energy, and our brain doesn't do as well with that. That's why we often have a crash, and that'll become, uh, if we have time, significant later as well. But on the right side of that diagram, we see a PTSD brain, and not only do we see that more of the brain has become inflamed, but they're white hot portions as well. And those white hot portions are the characteristic what's called diamond pattern, diamond like a precious stone, the diamond pattern brain that's characteristic for PTSD. Now, I said this earlier, and I'm going to reiterate it in more clear terms. Uh, in 2012, the name of post-traumatic stress disorder was changed to post-traumatic stress injury. And I agree with that, because if I tell you you have a disorder, it means the way we process it, that you have a something wrong with you. If I tell you that you have an injury, it means there is something that you can recover from. And I already talked about how aggressive and active I was with my own personal recovery. Also think about insurance purposes. Uh, if a person comes onto the job and they have that brain on the left, but leave the job with the brain on the right, that the only common denominator for those people is the job. And we can show direct correlation that the job does cause this injury. In fact, Washington is one of many presumptive states where we know that this will occur with such regularity with first responders that it is um, known or assumed that at the five and 10 year mark, the police officers and firefighters will have an inflamed brain. In the PTSI model on the right, though it says PTSD, if we were to take a look at the actual amygdalas, uh, which on the left show some activity, but on the right, um, if, if I show a different scan, we would see that it's often white hot constantly, and it's constantly on fire. The amygdalas have grown from the size of almonds to the size of walnuts, which is a significant um, problem. If you had any part of your body, let's say your calf or your um, elbow or your wrist that suddenly swelled up to more than double the size it was, we would worry about a problem there and we would call it swelling or inflammation and seek treatment for that, hopefully. Yet, because we don't see our brains and because we minimize that, we don't seek treatment or help for that. So a person who suffers from post-traumatic stress walks around with a continually inflamed brain that um, responds differently. Now, I told you that the amygdala is the threat response and processing center. And I told you that's often called the lizard brain because it instinctively helps, it helps us to instinctively deal with a problem. Um, that is also hooked to the hippocampus, which I showed you in that pepper scan. And I'll show you just really quickly again. I call it the pepper scan because they look like little chili peppers. And this is the pepper diagram again, the red portion being the hippocampus. The hippocampus is our learning portion of our brain. So what we're learning is to constantly be hypervigilant and responsive to threats in our environment. And it's an important center to have that linked up because if I see movement in the tall grass and then a uh, in my part of the country in Washington state, if a cougar suddenly comes out of the grass and I respond and move quickly away from it or yell and scare it away, I've learned that when the grass moves, the tall grass, that I have to be on point for a potential threat. But when I'm constantly on point and, and perceiving threat, I become hypervigilant. And that just further inflames the brain. It would be with the shoulder analogy again, like if I'm um, constantly um, striking out every time something happens and eventually I wear down my shoulder because I'm overusing it in response to threat. I'm gonna share another screen here. So as I share this one here, this is a um, picture of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And can you guys see that? the little black silhouette figures. Uh, 
There's one that drives me crazy on the bottom because substance abuse is uh, not spelled correctly, <laughs> but I didn't make this picture or um, design it. So, and this is a pretty common one that people use. So I talked about the chasm, the hole that we're trying to fill. And when your brain is constantly inflamed, uh, it means that certain things happen. It means that my startle response at home is inflamed too. And I've talked about this on this channel a lot, how when I had difficult times, I did really well at work because being on point like that in a patrol car is a good thing. And I can send this uh, link to you as well, if you'd like a copy of it. It's pretty common. I just Googled PTSD symptoms, and this is one of the more common ones. So that's why I use it. I don't know who to give credit to for this because there's no name or group associated with it. Um, when I came home from work, I was still in that hyper responsive mode where I would um, snap at my wife and kids. And I've mentioned this a lot and um, I couldn't shut it off. What happens is when we're in our safe place, our home, when we're trying to go to sleep, uh, if we have an adrenaline charged event, like say a near miss on an accident, if somebody assaults us, if we see something that is um, particularly disturbing, like an injured child or an older person, our adrenaline, our epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and especially cortisol and thousands of other chemicals flood our system. For an average person, it takes about 12 hours for those to start to dissolve and dissipate into the system. And so if at the beginning of my 10 hour shift, I have a flood of these chemicals, luckily nothing ever happens again during my shift. And then with the hour drive home, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> but that's not how it really is because for a dispatcher or a police officer or a firefighter, we have these ups and downs and multiple times during a shift, we'll have this response. So by the time I get home, especially if it happens towards the end of my shift, which we always joke about because that's when it seems to happen. Uh, if it happens at the end of my shift, I still haven't resolved that within my system. And I still have those chemicals floating around when I go home. And these are very damaging caustic chemicals, if not dealt with. They're called the fight or flight chemicals. And they're designed to, like I said, engorge our arms and legs with blood so we can fight or flee. And they're designed to protect us from a threat. Um, however, if we don't fight or flee actively and aggressively and burn stre and stress and burn those chemicals off, then they remain in our system and they take longer to dissipate. Um, I think we can all relate to a few examples. If you have ever had a very important interview with someone, uh, maybe for a job or maybe for an opportunity or something like that. And you begin to sweat differently and smell differently. It's that very ammonia, metallic-like smell that we emit from our bodies. That's the release of cortisol and these other chemicals. Um, also, research shows that tear composition, um, tears from crying, is different if it is stress-related tears, um, anxiety, Depression or sadness, uh, separate depression and sadness or joy, tears of joy. They have a different chemical composition. So we're literally shedding those chemicals and any excretion from the body. If you um, go to the bathroom, you you may smell a difference in those as well because we're excreting those chemicals. But imagine now finishing your 10 hour shift and going home, if which is rare on time, and then trying to go to sleep after that and interact with your family, and then going right back and doing it again. And then if you sign up for overtime, it's it's more often and more um, pronounced. So in the two or three days off that a first responder gets, we do not recover from this flood of chemicals. When we look at this chart here, there are a lot of things. Easily frightened, uh, which most of us <laughs> don't admit. Uh, we call it startle response or, or give it a different term. Um, but frightened is not a word that we tend to use in our vocabulary. So we have to be sensitive to that. Avoiding places. Um, here in the picture, it shows a swimming pool, which I guess could pertain. But if I put the word Walmart there <laughs> or family party or... Um, uh, something like that for avoiding places and activities, that's more relevant and first responders start nodding. And that is definitely something I was good at. I was a master isolator. Feeling guilt or shame, loss of interest, bad dreams, sleeping difficulty, aggressive behavior. That's what I talked about where I just 
seemed to be on edge and um, couldn't throttle it back and would snap at my um, loved ones. Inability to concentrate or sometimes hyper-focus is the opposite of that, where we get hyper-focused on a project and we'll go through and not eat. A lot of these sound like the diagnoses criteria for other um, brain-affected um, issues like attention deficit disorder. Again, that word disorder is inappropriate. Um, depression has similarities and so does anxiety. And so it's difficult sometimes for clinicians to properly diagnose post-traumatic stress. And a big portion of that with first responders is the lack of disclosure because we minimize, uh, we tend to say it's that one event, this happened. Um, that one event is usually the straw that broke the camel's back or the brick that tipped over the wall. But we have a stack of bricks or a stack of straws that preceded that event. And we often uh, fixate on the one thing and we don't disclose things because we say, ah, that wasn't a big deal. It was just a car accident. Or yeah, I was involved in a shooting, but I didn't get hurt. I won. You know, and we don't disclose the information about what we've actually seen and done. And it makes diagnosis and treatment hard for a group of people like me who are tough guys. And I use the finger quotes uh, because we are on camera. I, I don't really like those that much, but uh, I use it because um, I found out that um, in both contexts that I'm not as tough as I sometimes thought I was, you know, I'm not the Superman, Captain America, I am human and these things do affect me. And it's important for us to recognize that. Now, where I was fortunate is what filled that hole as I was hurting, uh, for me was my faith and prayer, um, being able to pray and say, I know there's a reason for this and I don't know what it is. Help me through. Um, I've seen um, other first responders in my family and definitely in my life turn to other things like alcohol. Alcohol works. It numbs you for a while. It um, makes those social activities and um, places that we see on the chart with people running away from it and the visceral reaction in the pictures that I'm showing you. Um, it makes those things a little more, more tolerable. It helps our fam family, familial interactions to be a little bit easier. And it helps us to sleep in the beginning. But after a while, we know that um, that dosage of alcohol, the drink or the two drinks or the three, um, isn't enough. And with first responders too, often uh, the body keeps the score is the name of a book, but it's also a philosophy in counseling because we recognize that when the brain is inflamed and it's at the, the base of the brain and the top of the spinal column, that our body with all the nerves that extend from that will begin to be affected. And that could be any number of things, including um, I could go on for days, but um, loss of hair, uh, coughing, sinus issues, um, huge digestive issues, sleep issues, um, physical pains and aches, um, rash, all kinds of things that people experience on a regular basis. I just listed some of the very common ones that I hear frequently when I help or deal with police officers and firefighters um, and all the others, EMS, dispatchers, corrections, et cetera, that have suffered from post-traumatic stress. So um, I'm, this is just an overview and I'm probably not spending anything near the time that I should be. I, I literally um, can teach on this and do for four and eight and 12 hour days. We have a 40 hour class about learning to deal with this. And we just kind of begin to touch on this. And you can imagine in a 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 year career, how much this can affect an individual. So we do know that because it is an injury with proper treatment and care, you can heal from it. Now, um, the word resilience has become really popular in the last several years. It used to be an unusual word, and I think it's a very appropriate word. I think it's a little bit overused, like a lot of words that I talk about on my list. Um, but resilience um, in its scientific definition means the ability of an object after being stretched or stressed to regain its original shape. So I think about a rubber band or a balloon. And I think about how those items, when stretched or stressed, can regain their original shape. But do they really? Um, have you ever, I know I have kids and I'm looking at several people here who have kids. Have you ever tried to blow up those little tiny balloons that come in for a kid's party? 
I felt like I was giving myself an aneurysm. My forehead, the veins were popping out. I looked like ET and I couldn't get that damn thing to inflate. And then, um, and you know, me, big tough guy, I work out, I should be able to do this, but I gave myself a headache trying to inflate them. When I finally got it to stretch and expand, it was painful for me, funny for my kids and family. But if I was unfortunate enough to let it slip out of my mouth and deflate, it was easier the second time to expand. So if we um, learn from these with that hippocampus diagram that I showed you, we have a stressful event and we learn from it, we stretch our brain and expand it. Now, to have it constantly stretched and stressed, those balloons don't last forever, right? They begin to deflate or they get popped eventually. And they don't pop when they are in their normal deflated state. They only pop when they're uh, inflated or inflamed. So if I learn from that, I can now regain that shape and learn more. And, and, and also with that same balloon or rubber band, once it's stretched, it can achieve a greater capacity the second time. But um, when we under, or excuse me, when we experience high level stress, critical stress after an event, we can learn from it. And that's called post-traumatic growth. But if we don't take steps to actively deflate that, then we're never the same again. Once you've experienced trauma, my shoulder now has, I've had surgery, I've had bone fragments removed, and I have um, stitches that have been added to sew things back together. And I've had the, I talked about the cotton ball earlier, I've had all those frayed ends to my muscle and uh, ligament and tendon tissue removed. And it was, uh, when I watched the video, it was traumatic. Uh, he was in there with spinning blades and cauterizing things, and it looked like a jack, mini jackhammer sewing things together, and I have scars. Now, I'm stronger in that shoulder than I ever was. However, it's never going to be the same. It's permanently changed. And we need to learn that though we talk about resilience, regaining our original shape, we never actually achieve the original shape that we were in, which is good because there's growth, because growth means expansion, development learning. And with that growth, I'm different now than I ever was. So I wanted to keep this short. And my goal was the half hour mark. I've gone a couple of minutes over that. And what I'd like to do is if there are specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. And with the power of our story, we have the on camera session, session or section where we talk on camera and it's later published, but we also have an off camera before and after. Uh, if you'd like to join us, all you have to do is look up Sarah on the power of our story, connect with her, tell her a little bit about yourself so that she can screen you and you can join us and you can be a part of these discussions afterwards. For now, for the on camera portion, if you have questions you'd like to ask on camera, I'm happy to answer them. And then after we finish that, we'll shut down and I'm happy to answer any more questions that come up. Oh, sorry, Michelle, go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so recently, so I was diagnosed with PTSD is what the diagnosis was. And it was like January, 2021. And so I've gone to, over two years now doing my journey, doing different healing modalities. And I had something new come up. I, I almost feel like every time we get to that point where we like, Okay, we fixed that portion. Something new comes up. And so the past couple of months, I've been dealing with, I guess it's called emotional dysregulation. And I actually looked up because I was like, oh my goodness, I am, I am like crazy. Like I can't control how I'm responding, good or bad. And so I looked it up and they actually have studies out there where they've talked about people with PTSD having a problem regulating their emotions again. But I just kind of wanted to know what, if you have any experience and maybe advice, um, like I said, it's not all bad. I went to the 4th of July parade in, in Pocatello and Pocatello is so much smaller of a community than where I came from in Henderson, Nevada. And I'm literally standing there thankfully had sunglasses on and I am just, I'm bawling my eyes out because I am so overwhelmed with the, the, the community support. And there was so many like 
people supporting police and the fire and you know everyone supports the fire guys but they were supporting the police but I was so the the feeling it wasn't just oh this is really cool to be a part of this community it was like I'm a blubbering mess and I talked with um I have an amazing therapist who is a veteran herself and I talked with her and she said Michelle for at least 14 years that's how long your career was, let alone like not even counting any childhood trauma. But for 14 years, you bottled up all your emotional responses. And she's like, now you're finally learning that it's okay to feel. And I was like, wow, but it still sucks because it's not just the happy, it's the angry, it's the sad. I will literally cry at a stupid commercial and I feel like I'm pregnant again, but I promise y'all I'm not. But I, it's, it's interesting to see. And I feel like, I'm like, man, sometimes I'm like the crazy psycho girlfriend, fiance or something, or I'm the overreactive mom or whatever. So I just would love to hear what you, your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the term emotional dysregulation is a term that could be used to describe a mom, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, or or a person who cares. Now, I, I, I experienced the same thing. And I think that um, your therapist is correct when she said you have masked or hidden or suppressed the ability to feel for a long time. But one of the things that I appreciate about my personal journey is I can feel more deeply all of those emotions. And um, we don't like that realm. Uh, it's not okay to be on the console as a dispatcher like you were and get angry. Sometimes you do though, with that person that calls in or the, the officer who's running way too many plates towards the end of the shift. <laughs> I've been that guy. Uh, but um, we it's not okay to start crying. It's not okay to um, start yelling. And when we do, what do we do? We shut it off right away. We stand up. We pretend it's not happening. So the ability to feel more deeply, it's that balloon that I talked about. Once it's stretched, it can't go back to its original shape. Uh, when I watch a Disney movie, my daughter will look me right in the eye and say, is daddy crying yet? It's her job to babysit me. And I usually end up, I am crying. <laughs> I usually end up saying, nope, I'm fine. But just got something in my eye. <laughs> but the ability to feel more deeply is foreign to us because we often come into these jobs suppressing those emotions anyway. And that's what makes us good for the job, but you can only do it so long. It's like shaking up that carbonated beverage and popping the cap off of it. All of that stuff bubbles over. Um, one of the analogies I love that my friend taught me uh, during counseling of other people is um, if you decide one day you're just not gonna poop anymore, How's that going to go for you? <laughs> you say, I'm not doing it. It's messy. It, it's stinky. I hate it. It's, it, it takes time out of my day. I'm just not going to poop. At some point, you're going to have to poop. And it's probably going to sneak up on you when you least expect it. And then it's going to be even messier and worse if you don't deal with it. So we can't say that we're not going to feel anymore. It's like saying you're not going to poop. And when we do, it finally bubbles over. Um, the fact that you're able to do that shows that you've made huge steps in your own journey and your recovery. And you should actually feel like that's a little check mark. And how amazing is it to feel uh, what you're feeling is gratitude, right? Gratitude, not only for all the people showing their support and the amazing community you live in, which is amazing. I just saw Michelle there not too long ago. But what you're also feeling is gratitude for your own journey and how far you've come. And I say, keep those sunglasses on and let it flow. Because again, those tears are releasing things. And in this case, it's it's the testing for happiness and gratitude. And that's what the chemical results would show. Um, if you feel, though, that you've uncovered other things that are negative, that's what happens as we shuffle. I've talked often here about the bag of rocks, and I won't do that again. But we go through collecting these rocks that are experiences. And if we deal with one and minimize the size of that rock, others will come up. And that's normal. Uh, I have a good friend who doesn't live too far from you. And he called me one day and said, hey, I need a counselor. I just saw a bad accident, got out and helped. I just want to do some quick work on it. He did some EMDR to as a preventative measure, knowing that it was going to affect him later. It reminded him of other events and it worked. So part of that too, if I use the shoulder analogy again, is I'm going to have times where it's sore or where it hurts 
uh, maybe with weather changes or activity. And I need to be aware of that and sensitive to that. And perhaps I need to go in and do some additional work, which is called physical therapy. And it's cool. But when it's mental health therapy, we don't do it. Did that make sense, Michelle? It did. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a blessing to be able to feel again. And I love where I'm at right now to be able to sit with people that I care about, like you guys, and and express that emotion. I love being able to cry in front of a person. I'm no longer worried about being perceived as the tough guy. I've got all this stuff. I can show that off anytime I want all these cool badges and awards saying that I am a tough guy. But the truth is that I'd rather be the person I am now, that balloon that's been stretched and be able to feel the depth of emotion that I couldn't feel before, or I didn't allow myself to feel. Cool. Do you have more on that? Or uh, does somebody else have a question? Do you have any more, Michelle? No, I'm good. Cool. I'm happy to hear that. That makes me happy. Does anybody else have any questions? I, I have some comments to make, but um, I, I can wait until the questions are finished. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to intercede. How about, um, go ahead, Paul and my Baya. I'm sorry about that. Baya, I see you're here. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to wrap up with, you are the expert in this. And I'm just the knuckle dragging police officer. <laughs> and I think Sarah has a question. I don't know if oh, it's a question. Or go not. ahead, Sarah. I just wanted to thank you. It was actually more just, a, I, I, I felt like it was so concrete and clear what you shared. And I don't feel like many presentations on post-traumatic stress are like that. And I, I think um, this is going to be really wonderful for our community and to put it out there so they truly can see this is a physical wound. Post-traumatic <clears throat> stress really is a, a physical wound that has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just want to appreciate you <clears throat> for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I don't put it in simple terms, a knuckle dragging and use crayons, a knuckle dragging guy like me won't get it. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Um, but it, it is um, an injury. And we used to call it the injury you can't see. But with brain scans, we can see it. And there are a lot more. If All you have to do is Google uh, post-traumatic stress brain scan, and it shows you the difference. There's some interesting photos with TBI and the comparison and similarities and differences. Uh, and that person who does those brain scans, that specialist is actually linked up with us and first responder wellness so that we can all gain greater depth and understanding. Uh, Lisa, I see your hand as well. Go ahead. I do, but it's a comment, but it's along the lines of the brain scan. Um, has anyone heard of the Amen clinics? You have Sarah. Uh, I'm going to put the link up. It's, um, this guy, he's, I, I learned about him on Dr. Phil. <laughs> I call him Dr. Pill. Um, but it has all kinds of, um, like you can go in, um, for all these, all these issues, eating disorders, drug and alcohol addiction, concussions and traumatic brain injury, PTSD or I, um, and you can see they have a bunch of spec scans in there that each, um, each, like, say, if it's an addiction, you'll see where the brain is lit up in that addiction center, um, PTSI, same thing. So I'm just going to put the link there. And if anybody's interested in looking more um, at these SPECT scans is what they're called, you might gain a lot from it. Because like you said, Patrick, um, it's an invisible injury. And I, and in until I saw that scan is like, well, no wonder I was <laughs> jacked up, you know? Um, but anyway, it's real helpful. So I'm just going to put the link uh, out here for everyone. If anybody's interested, thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. I think um, it's important to mention that there is healing and there are modalities and mechanisms that can help people to heal from most of these things that we're talking about. Um, sometimes medication is necessary because it helps us. And to, to keep going back to the shoulder, my doctor said, I know how you guys are. You don't like to take meds. You're going to refuse to do it. But as long as your joints 
are inflamed, they're in a constant state of um, contraction and they're not going, you're not going to heal if you're constantly contracted, you have to allow them to relax. And that's all I'm giving you is something to help you relax those joints. So medication can be a very important piece, but I really caution people about adding chemicals to a chemical infused system. I talked about all the chemicals that are released in your body during times of stress. And if you're living in that constant state with those chemicals flooding your body regularly, introducing more can be problematic, especially with first responders, because we're all in on everything. Um, first responders will seek out help and do everything, every single treatment at once. And it's like trying a new diet. You don't know what's working or new medication. You don't know what's working unless you single it out and see what your response is to each individual thing. I am uh, not a fan because we don't have the data on it of some of the um, hallucinogens or um, some of the things that are being used to treat these disorders because with other similar things, like for example, the cannabis experiments have failed and it showed that people became more um, prone and like prone to and likely to have post-traumatic stress and other ailments like schizophrenia when they use that as a modality. And now people are using ketamine, ayahuasca, peyote, all these hallucinogens, which um, may help, but I think that there are lots of um, treatments and mechanisms that can be used like EMDR, ART, accelerated resolution therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, neural feedback and neural therapy that can actually in those scans show the healing of the brain progressively and target certain areas. And it's my personal hope that people try that first before going to some of these extreme measures. And I think it's important to say that. That could be a whole different discussion. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> You know, it's interesting when I did my practicum for addiction counseling at a <clears throat> very seasoned addiction counselors, you know, 20 years in the field, um, that's, they share too. That's what they see people coming in that there's a, you have a baseline people who smoke uh, pot, they take THC, their baseline of anxiety raises. And so even though it's not thought of as an addictive uh, substance, um, it's definitely an emotional. Is is that how you would frame it? It's an it's it's, and like you said, that it can trigger uh, genetic um, issues like schizophrenia, just like you said. I mean, that's terrifying. Like I I would think that this should be shared everywhere. That this is especially because the THC um, is so high. It's not like the seventies. It's a totally different substance that that people are using. Well, I, I agree with everything you said, and that's all accurate. However, um, the propensity for a reaction with schizophrenia or um, bipolar disorder, paranoid schizophrenia, depression, anxiety have always been anecdotally recognized, even like you mentioned during the 60s and 70s, when the THC content was lower, that was still recognized, but it wasn't legal because marijuana was illegal to test that and the results that were garnered from that were considered anecdotal at best. Now we have hard data, and the hard data is undeniable. Uh, it's been legal in a lot of places. Here in Washington, we in Colorado were the first two. So we have more than a decade. And I said, we're going to see the negative results in 10-year period. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that there are absolutely verified links and correlation to all those um a lot, uh, those maladies that I mentioned, the uh, depression, anxiety, uh, et cetera, and the schizophrenia. And um, with the veterans in large numbers, they began saying, um, well, there's there seems to be some hope with post-traumatic stress treatment. And of course there was, because like alcohol, for a period of time, they were under the influence of it and felt better. However, at the expense of a lot of mm -hmm. veterans, they and, and there is, uh, to say it's not addictive has been disproven as well. It is absolutely addictive. Um, it's, it was called a psychotropic drug, and that's why it was originally made illegal, because of its effects on the brain. But we find out that those... Um, cannabinoid sensors are not only in the brain, but throughout the body. And they were called that during the 70s because initial research only showed a response to um, cannabis. 
But then we find that exercise and intimate sexual relations, intimate meaning with a person you actually love and care about, not a random person that you met somewhere. Um, we find that um, social interaction like this excite the same uh, receptors in your in your brain and throughout your body, especially in your digestive system that are called the cannabinoid re receptors. And we can fill those with naturally occurring good things instead of chemical chemicals being introduced to a chemical filled body. Whew, that was a mouthful. I don't know if that even made sense. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying in short is that we have hard data now showing that it is addictive. It, it, it can be harmful and it can trigger these other responses like we talked about and illnesses within the body that sometimes are even harder to recover from. And yet they're still prescribing it to veterans. I think that's where part of the tragedy lays. And veterans are also uh, being experimented on with these other mechanisms and modalities that I talked about, like ketamine and um, psilocybin and other things. So I'm trying to help the people I love and care about, the military first responders and those family members, uh, because um, perfect example, we have Catherine here who um, wasn't a first responder, but grew up in a first responder family. And whether um, she will have, it's reasonable to assume that she will have vicarious trauma, watching her loved ones go through that and experiencing their manifestation of um, post-traumatic stress in her life. And that's what happened to me before I even went into the profession. So it is normal to experience these things. And I want to emphasize that what we're talking about those are normal reactions to abnormal situations. We as humans aren't supposed to see death on a large scale, addiction, um, horrible things happening. That's a moral injury that hurts us sometimes more deeply than a personal injury that occurs to us. To watch somebody else suffer through something where we can't help them is a moral injury. Betrayal through your administration or um, occupation is also a huge one that causes moral injury that's very difficult to recover from because it's so deep-seated and we have this sense of wrong. And yet, these people that we're talking about see it on a regular basis. So this is normal. These responses are normal. It's that rubber band. If we stretch it enough, eventually it completely loses its original shape. It's but incredible. also, if it's not used, it becomes hard and brittle and will snap when we try to stretch it. So thank you. Baya, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yes, I think you did a good job. Um, I appreciate you, your sharing. I will say that the, the, the way to, uh, I love EMDR. I love EMDR as a way to, dealing, to deal with the uh, PTSD or PTSI, how you want to, uh, to call it. The, the thing that I'm realizing that what you do in there is you really you really help the uh, what has been uh, stored in in a, in an, in a way that is unhealthy to rejoin the the healthy memory and and also you help with the reactivity that means you can now uh, think about those events with less reactivity because for for some reason it helps with the eye movement to uh, to make uh, to uh, restore the connection right brain left brain and uh, the only other thing that i wanted to say was like um you know when the pref the prefrontal cortex uh, the prefrontal cortex is the most important part i mean it's an important part of our brain because it regulates the the emotion it regulates it uh, in, in any voluntary movement any voluntary conscious action and and uh, behavior in, is initiated there. It regulates uh, uh, the attention, the decision-making process, and also the interpretation of emotion. And all this is really affected with, with PTSD. I will just add one thing because I don't want to complicate, but I think we, we rarely talk about the soul injury. And I think it's uh, the soul is 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 uh, is important. And when you see things that are um, I will outside of the normal re realm of what we're supposed to experience, um, I do believe that we're living a little bit aside the the soul injury. I I love you so much. Thank you so much for that. That was so beautiful. Um, I often, in different terms, will talk to people and say. 
uh, what she said, but I say it differently. I say we're taking that trigger or flashback and we're changing it to a memory. And so you can revisit the memory when you want to, but we're changing the impact of it. Would you agree with that, Baya? And I love the soul injury. I think, boy, that's something yeah. I, I love. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, I, I, uh, uh, I'm okay with you. Okay, however you want to look at it. The fact when, uh, um, when a memory is stored in a place, um, a, a reactive place, it's, it's not, it's not processed. And when it's processed healthily, it's going to run the, the healthy memory. Uh, and now you're going to, uh, you're going to see, uh, this is what you call, uh, a link from it. Post traumatic is you get to a place where it's in a healthy way and, uh, and you can move forward in life. Yes. I don't like the term you, be, you go back to, uh, uh, old uh, the old part because you never really go back you go forward and uh, um, obviously um, there's always a learning thing, hopefully when you when you heal so the you're in a different place you're never going to be back in the same place uh, but you you pass the event in a healthy way and you can uh, become you 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 became event. Um, I don't like the idea to go back to, no, it's, we move forward, we grow, we change, we mature, we, and the brain the same. It's, it, what, what was unhealthy can, go, can be stored in a healthy way. I love that. Um, much, to use the shoulder analogy again, if my shoulder, when it was injured, I would compensate for that by using other parts of my body. Sometimes I would lift with my other hand, or sometimes my bicep or my uh, chest would take over that movement, which isn't healthy either, because now that area that needs to be strengthened and develop the shoulder itself and recover isn't doing that. And she is correct that when we're not using our brain properly, as it was designed and intended to be used, that we use other portions to compensate. And so recovering on some level so that we can use our brain as, is, as it is intended to be used, we process information better and not everything is a threat anymore. So uh, Michelle, go ahead. Um, so two things. One, Abaya, I always love your input. I hope one day to be able to sit down and actually chat with you more. But you know what? You're absolutely right. We're not going to be the same once hey, we're mama. healed. But after all this, everything that's uncovered and I see how unhealthy I was prior to finally being diagnosed and starting to heal, I don't want to be how I used to be, you know, and I think we take a big part of that with us. We want to, we realize the, the grass is greener on the other side. We just got to get to that other side. So I just, I wanted to add that. And then I also wanted to ask you guys, it's interesting. We're talking about these brain scans and everything. And I was listening to Anxiety Guys, one of their podcasts the other day, and their guest on there was saying, you know, PTSI is the only injury that you don't have some type of scan for first before healing it. He was like, when you break an elbow or you break your arm, they're going to scan it. They're going to do some type of scan on it to see the injury before they put the cast on. And I realized like, I've never had a brain scan done before. So what, how... How do I go about doing that? What if I want to see what my brain looks like during my healing journey? Where do we do that? How do we do that type of thing? Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people doing it right now. Um, Lisa shared a link to a group that's um, doing it. And it's one of the few groups doing it right now. Um, and we don't have a baseline either. Um, we don't have what your brain looked like before. We only have where it's at now, which is the same with a shoulder injury or some other. Often we'll see that an area is inflamed or um, heat. There's heat in the area because of healing, or we could see dead tissue. Um, and so there aren't a lot of people doing it. Although because the science is so needed, there are more and more people expanding. And so I would say, if that's something you're interested in doing, I would simply ask your provider and say, hey, uh, I would bring in a couple of the pictures that I shared. Again, you can Google uh, post-traumatic stress brain scan. You can say, 
I'm very interested in this. I'd like to see what I look like. And they usually have the technology. They have MRIs and CAT scans and all kinds of equipment to do things like that, but they don't normally use it for that purpose. They would if you had head trauma in a car accident, right. but they don't use it for these things. So, Well, I remember we had that guest on the Power of Our Story. I think it was about a month or so ago. And he runs the addiction clinic for first responders out of California. And he said, very first thing we do is we scan their brains when they come in make sure there's nothing paired with the PTSI or like the TBI or something like that. So I just find it interesting that it's not a tool used at the beginning to help with diagnosis, whether for workers' comp claims or something like that. Um, when I said that, what I should have added to that is sometimes because it's not the normal treatment or modality, it can be very expensive because it's not what it it's like getting a medication that works for one ailment but isn't designed for that and um i forget the term but it's it's used not as prescribed it's used differently that can be very expensive and difficult so i would not just ask for it and go with it and then get a huge bill <laughs> i would ask is this something that's covered by my insurance provider and something that you can do and if you have a progressive thinking um clinician like baya or a doctor, I'm sure they would work with you to find a way to do it, but I wouldn't just do it without checking on it first. Sarah, go ahead. Um, I have a whole list of things I probably will not get through all of them because of time. But the first one is that the issue of faith and the difference in the effect of prayer is really a simple one. We pray to a living God. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. And, and, and you know, I, I'm a strong believer and I am not ashamed of it or I don't apologize for it. But I pray to a living God and I know that he hears me. And I know that he will answer in his own time and according to his own plan. And so the best I can hope for is that I get to discern that plan and the timing. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I want to share is that there are two kinds of brain scans. I had an MRI done on my brain some years ago. and more recently, because I now have a pacemaker, um, I have had a CT scan with contrast dye. And both produce some pretty amazing images, although the MRI is more detailed. And that's because it's sliced in the little pieces that you can then go through as a series of um, images, if you will, and you can see where things start to change. Um, so those are both available, and neither of them are inexpensive, but uh, when needed, those are choices that we have. And I think the next thing I'd like to share is that I view forgiveness as one of the greatest gifts we've ever been given. And it was witness to on the cross. And when you're, I mean, it's difficult for me to even imagine this, but when you're hanging on a cross and you forgive the two people hanging on the crosses next to you, if that isn't the ultimate in forgiveness, I don't know what is. And so I view it as a gift and second only to salvation. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that. Um, the next thing I'll bring up, which is a little bit different than what has been talked about, but I think it's important. And that is that we accumulate plaque in our arteries, in our capillaries, all over the place uh, for a number of reasons. And that plaque, there is, um, there are things that can help remove that plaque. 
and you see it particularly in the brain. And when the arteries or the capillaries in the brain are clogged up with plaque, that means wherever they were going to deliver the oxygen and nutrients to is not going to get there. And so you begin to have a brain of lesser capacity. It's not just about memory, it's about function. As, as, as you said, Pat, all of the organs in the body are regulated by that brain. I have in my brain stem a calcified uh, vessel, the main blood vessel going up the brain stem. And there is nothing they can do about it. Um, I offered, when, when it was discovered, I offered to have a brain stem transplant. And the doctor said, well, we're not doing those this week and we're not likely to do them next week or ever. <laughs> and I knew, I, you know, I was just playing with it at that point. <clears throat> but with regard to the issue of feeling weakness, when you have a mental health issue. I believe that arises out of the stigma that is created by leadership in law enforcement. Law enforcement looks at you and says, all right, we're going to renew, remove your name from your mailbox and you won't be working here anymore. I mean, it really is that simple. And I've seen it happen. And I, I'm not going to get into the war stories about it, but it's sudden and it's drastic. And you no longer have a duty weapon. You no longer have any of the gear that you, you have. So in addition to having the mental health issue, now you have an identity issue and a loss of camaraderie. And that desperately needs to be turned around uh, because it is not wrong to have a mental health issue. It is not something you created. It is something that you that arose from your circumstances. And it's something that can be dealt with if it's handled by somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, with regard to fight or flight, there's a third component, and I call it fight, fight, flight, or freeze. Some of which are more dangerous than others for you. Uh, um, I found that the situational awareness versus hypersensitivity the hypersensitivity seems to come into play when you are in that moment where you need it. Else situational awareness allows you to start counting the shots without even realizing you're doing it when you hear gunfire. And the point of that is A, to know how many shots were uh, fired and B, to be able to pick up the uh, shells and, and account for them. Um, and when you get into court, that becomes kind of critical. Um, when, what, one of the things that we found in, in our little department was that when somebody retired, if they no longer had a purpose, they didn't have either another job to go to or a hobby that was important to them um, or helping others. In seven years, they expired because I've, they literally had no purpose for living. In the last three years, Paul, just so you know, for law enforcement specifically, that number has changed to five years. Five years after retirement, officers die of a heart attack. Within seven years, firefighters die from cancer. So it's sad. And to add to what you're saying, the fastest growing um, rate of suicide 
is among retired police officers and firefighters. So it's already the number one cause of death for both professions, but now with retired guys, it's becoming quickly one of the top causes of death. So sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's, I, I appreciate knowing that because it was seven years at the time that I uh, left, uh, but I went to another job immediately. In fact, I was kind of hired away from where I was. And, and at that time it was seven years and I have not followed it since. So oh, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, with regard to avoiding places, I found that I was extremely uncomfortable in a crowded room of people who were drinking <laughs> because I didn't know what was going to show up. And so I just avoided those kinds of things. And I avoided um, parties. I'm not a big party goer anyway, but I like to be around people and to socialize, particularly when they're peers and, and other kinds of folks like that. Um, but generally, uncontrollable circumstances made me very, very uncomfortable. And so I just made it a point to avoid them. It's like so many things in my life. I've determined when somebody disagrees with me and gets rude about it, uh, I don't need to argue with them. I just put distance between me and them, and it's done. I, I don't have to win. <laughs> While your microphone was cutting out on that, I did hear what you said that you gain distance when somebody is uh, in conflict, but your microphone is staticky, just so you know, and the volume Thank is low. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I think that's probably all I really need to cover right now. I Well, I will say one more thing. There is the notion of having to be tough on the job. And I used to tell my officers and my squad, I want you to be smart on the job. And I want you to think through the outcomes and you have to do it quickly. But do you want to escalate this or do you want to de-escalate it? And the other thing I told them is there's not a single badge made in this country that will prevent a bullet from going through it. And so just keep that in mind. Um, in any event, I, I, I have other things to share, but there are other people that want to talk, and, and uh, I should let them have a chance to. We appreciate you, Paul. Thank you. There's a lot of wisdom in everything you said. Um, I just feel it's interesting that um, at the base of your brain where the amyg amygdala that we talked about rests, that's the part that is inflamed. Um, we used to talk about cholesterol being attributed to diet, but cholesterol is a marker for inflammation and it goes to areas that are inflamed to protect the lining of those um, veins and passages and sometimes the brain. And so the fact that you have that area inflamed and calcified with an excessive amount of cholesterol is not surprising because just like we talked about, your amygdala was inflamed for so, so long, your body's trying to protect itself. And so it just kind of reinforces everything in the physiological sense that we were talking about in the psychological sense. Thank you. Catherine, you've been patient yeah. too. Um, with, I would like to say, I think we're recording again. So uh, at this point, we're going to stop the recording. And if you're still with us and you have questions about what's going on, feel free to contact me, contact Sarah, contact Baya for the power of our story. Rejoin us and come back for future conversations. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you here soon.